over the last few weeks, we've been talking about seeds. And the cool thing about this is this morning at One Life Community Church, they're downtown, and here this morning, we're, we're teaching the same, same message. And so um, this has been exciting over the last a few weeks in this series. And uh, in this, uh, we've been talking about seeds and about Jesus and his teaching through parables, through stories. And in this particular passage, if you have a, a Bible, you can open it up to Matthew chapter 13. That's where we're going to be today. There's Bibles uh, right up here that are free for you to take with you. Um, you can look on version as well. Matthew chapter 13, this is a series of seven different parables that Jesus teaches. These parables are just, they're stories that reveal a truth within the story to those who are, are wanting to hear the truth, those who want, want to receive the truth. And so in this, the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the, the parable of the, the net, the, these seven parables, but there's this, there's this ending in these. Jesus goes to his hometown there in Nazareth and he teaches there and then people are like, wait a second, we know him. He's, uh, he's uh, the one who, he's, he's Mary's son. We know his brothers and sisters. He's a carpenter. And then Jesus says, after these different parables, he says a, a prophet's not without honor except in his hometown and in his own home. And then he says this right here, and this has been really challenging for me. Um, and he did not do many miracles there in Nazareth because of their lack of faith. Just a, a, a challenge. Questions start to arise. You know, they, there were not many miracles in Nazareth because of their lack of faith. I think about my own life. It, is, is my faith keeping Jesus from doing miracles in my own life and the lives of the people around me? If that can happen in Nazareth, can it happen here, Wichita Falls? Like, what, what's, what's my part in this? What, what's your part? And is our faith in Jesus in some way keeping Jesus from doing the miraculous in, in our lives, in the lives of the people around us, in, in our city. And so I, I want us to pick this up because one of the biggest issues that we have when it comes to the miraculous and, and, and all of this is that we have this bent toward big. And we think, you know, Big faith, big miracles. I'm looking for miracles and looking for big moments, big answers to prayer, big blessings, big provision, big changes in my life and the, and the people around me. We can't help. We can't help this partially because we live in Texas, right? And everything's big in Texas. Did y'all know this is the biggest buoy knife in the world. It's 20 feet long, weighs over 3,000 pounds, made out of metal. This is, I've lived here my whole life. This is 50 miles from here in Bowie, Texas. Have any of you ever seen this? I just want to meet you. When we get done, I want to meet you, and I, I want to hear all about it. I, I've never seen it. We, we love big. Uh, right here, this, this, this is the biggest bass drum in the world right here. Hook em horns. Yeah, this thing is... 55, uh, 55 inches deep. It's nine and a half feet in diameter. This is a big Bertha two right here. We love big. We got big Tex at the State Fair, the big Texan in Amarillo. We got the big 12. <laughs> Don't laugh too hard. <laughs> See, we, we have this bent toward, toward big. We do. And everything in the kingdom of God starts small. Um, 
We, we want the big and we, we miss the small. We miss the, what God's doing. We, we don't understand, we struggle to understand how God's kingdom works in our lives. And, and then when this happens, when we, when we don't value and participate in the small, we become frustrated and irritated and we quit on God and what, what he can do. If only, if only we could value the small. If only we could value the small. Even, even small faith. Pick this up, Matthew 13, verse 31. He told them another parable. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field, though it's the smallest of all seeds. Yet when it grows, it is the largest of, of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. You see this image here, this, this mustard seed. It's, it's so so small, and Jesus uses this mustard seed. It was the smallest thing that they could, in that day, could visibly see, an everyday object to teach them about God, to teach them about how God's kingdom works. And, and if we, we think about seed, and we think about bird, we think, you know, bird seed, Right? Seed is food for birds, but not in God's kingdom. Jesus is saying, you take this small seed and plant it in the ground and care for it, and over time, the seed becomes a tree. And these mustard trees, they can be anywhere from 6 to 30 feet in height. And then birds sit in those trees. Kingdom of God's completely counterintuitive. It's backwards from our thinking, from our understanding. Jesus refers to this mustard seed again just a few chapters further in uh, Matthew chapter 17. You can flip there if you want to. But uh, in that, with, with Jesus and what happens is Jesus is there. He takes a couple of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. They go up to the top of a mountain. They're there. And in this moment, they have this this miracle moment at the top of this mountain, this, this bright light, this cloud is over them with this bright light. Jesus, his whole being just illuminates, glows so bright. And then he's talking to Moses and Elijah. They, they show up in this supernatural form, and Peter, James, and John, they're freaking out. I mean, they're in the moment. They're like, oh, my gosh. And they get so excited about this that they're like, hey, uh, Jesus, can we build some, like, shelters here? Like, one for you and one for And, like, let's just stay here. This is a bro moment. We're going to be here, all six of us. And let's just stay here, you know? And then there's this, this voice, this light, and uh, the voice of God speaks and says, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. They hit the ground they're so freaked out, just down, don't know what to do. Jesus tells them, don't be afraid, get up. And I tell you that because they were on top of this mountain. They didn't want to leave that moment. The problem is we, we never stay on the mountain in life. We, we always have to come down and often it's down into the mundane, everyday life. Sometimes it's even further down in dark valleys. And then the question is, will I use what I learned on the mountain as I'm walking through the valley? I can't stay on the mountain. Will I live out what I learned in the big moment as I'm walking through the every day and sometimes the every day is really difficult will I live this out when I can't see what's in front of me and I have no idea how many miles it is until the next mountaintop 
no coincidence that Jesus takes them down and then they're faced with this incident right here. Matthew 17, verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He had, has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Just pause real quick. The disciples couldn't heal people. You can't heal people. I can't heal people. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can. Jesus continues on. Uh, you unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? We read this and we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus is hot. You know? This, this word unbelieving, he, he didn't just mean like, you know, you're lacking in faith. You need some more faith. He meant like no faith. And this word perverse, we can take this all kinds of directions. But it, it literally, it means to be twisted, to be distorted. Not, it's the opposite of how it should be. Jesus isn't mad because this boy wasn't healed. Here, look here. Uh, Jesus says, bring the boy to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why, why couldn't we drive it out? I don't know about you, but can you, can you hear that discouragement? Like, why, why couldn't we do this? Like many of us, we get in those moments where we don't understand what God's doing. We don't understand. They knew Jesus could do amazing things. They wanted Jesus to do amazing things. They just didn't know how to participate in the process. Verse 20, he replied, like, why couldn't we heal this boy? Because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it'll move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus contrasts the smallest thing that they could visibly see with their eye, this mustard seed, in a backdrop of the largest thing they could see, the mountains of Galilee. What Jesus is really saying is your understanding is distorted. You have no faith and you fail to understand the power that is in me. This is why Jesus responded this way. If, if we don't understand the, the seed, the person of Jesus, and how he comes in our lives to help us, and how powerful his kingdom is, then all we are left with is living out, and we're living out life from our own ability. What, what we can do. If, if you don't have the, the seed of Jesus, then, then we're left looking for answers, trying to figure it out, we're asking friends for help. Have you, people come to me even think that I'm, I'm the answer? No. Pastor isn't the answer. Jesus is saying, you're overlooking me. The seed of God. Small makes a big difference. Small mustard seed faith, it, it matters. So if, if we're going to talk about faith, then we have to open up and talk about the very thing that opposes so much of our faith, this weapon that the, the enemy, he overwhelms us and paralyzes and plagues our life with. Because the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's fear. It's fear. The constant climate of our culture is fear. Fear gets our attention. Fear 
sells fear, divides us. Fear creates these clicks. Fear feeds anxiety and drives depression. Fear is a powerful motivator for you and for me. And what is so interesting is that we come into this world with two innate fears. The fear of falling and loud noises. Everything else is learned. Every other fear that you and I have has accumulated because of the experiences of our life. I love this. Uh, my wife Ashley and I, we, we have a marriage counselor and listen, we fight, you know, like what, I can say we, co- we have conflict, you know, <laughs> come on, we've been married almost 22 years now. Um, and, 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 in working with, with our therapist or our counselor, and then also me like counseling couples, um, it's just so interesting because like there's this process with the conflict that there's oh, this and this, and then we're talking about this and we're fighting over this. And, it, and really, if we can just take all of these layers off, I will tell you, if we will come down even further and she'll always tell us, find the fear. Find the fear in this. When there's conflict, what what is it that's really going on? Because if you can find that fear and you both understand it, then there's this connection. And that's what we all want. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? I can tell you, I'll, I'll be real, just been in ministry now for 20 years, and I'll tell you, I, I am afraid I'm going to mess up my kids. Anybody else? Come on. All right. Like, I'm just afraid I'm going to mess them up. They've been, listen, they've been through a lot. They've been through very young in a church plant. They've been through people coming in and out of our lives, people who are there and all about it. And, just in, and then the next thing you know, it's like crickets, they're gone. My fear is that in some way, they don't love the bride because the bride's a bunch of messed up people. My fear is that um, in that too, that that'll skew their, their love for Jesus. But he gave his life for his bride. That's a real fear. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe with your, your kids and growing up in this day, and I'm glad that I am not a teenager right now. Man. Maybe it's a health issue, and maybe there's just been this fear, like, circulating around, like, I don't know, it could be cancer. I, I, I'm not sure. Maybe it's this fear of, of being single, and just like, I don't know, I might be my, myself for the rest of my life. I don't know. Maybe for someone here, maybe it's a, maybe you've come out of addiction, but you have this fear that this relapse is imminent. It's very real. We all, we all, have, we all have fears, but fear will rob you of your faith if you let it. And the answer to fear, the answer to fear isn't solved by big answers, okay? I'm telling you, like, if you're having marriage issues and things are falling apart and it's about to be over, Jesus is not going to show up and shake both of you and just say, come on, y'all get it together, let's go. And you're like, cool. It's not going to happen in a moment like that. You got a teenager who's like wandering off doing their own thing in a lot of trouble. You aren't going to pray a prayer at night and then that teenager wake up the next morning and be like, Mom and Dad, you never believe it. I love Jesus. I'm back on the straight and narrow. It's happening. Just happened. One prayer, big prayer, happened. You have financial problems? Listen, there's not going to be a check in the mailbox from the long lost relative that has lots of zeros after it. It doesn't show up like that. It's not big answers. The the answer, listen to me, is a small seed of faith. A small seed of faith. 
how does faith work like a seed? I got to be real with y'all about this. Like so many people think that like, oh, you've got to be like super uh, religious, super Christian. Like you got to be a pastor, a professional, have this big mountain moving faith. No, 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 no. The faith that Jesus is talking about is for all of us, every single one of us. This is super important, and this is why this is faith does not start with you. Faith starts with God. We have this backwards. We have it so backwards. We think that it's about us and me and how much faith I have and we think that like if we just have this, you know, positive thinking and we work up some willpower. No. Faith, it starts with God because God is faithful. It's who he is. Over and over again throughout the scriptures, we, we see this. So how does it work like a seed? It, it has to do with God's nature because he is faithful. Deuteronomy 7, 9 Know that therefore the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God. This, this word here in the Hebrew, faithful, aman, and, and it means reliable, constant, sure. And it also means to, in that consistency, support and foster as a parent. I don't know about y'all, but that right there, ding, 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 ding. You want to know why we struggle with our faith in God, why so many of us struggle with our faith in God? Because all we've known is fractured families. I can, I can speak on this. Ashley and I together, like our family tree, it's not like this straight in there. It's like a bonsai tree. There's all kinds of steps and this and that and X's and, you know, Because the, the family dynamics that we've experienced are unreliable, inconsistent, unsure. Any of us that come from fractured families, we, whether, it's, whether it's neglected or, or being abused, with, and then there's divorce, abandonment, What happens is this is all we've known. Therefore, we project that onto how we see God. God's nature is faithful, but we haven't experienced that in this earthly family. But our Heavenly Father is faithful. He is constant. He does not change. He knows your future better than you know the present. We will never have faith when we trust in human beings to fix our problems more than we trust God. Faith is, I know my God. I, I know his character. I know who he is. He's faithful to me. The second part of this is um, his word is reliable. But we all have fears. We all have fears. And when those fears start to creep in, this will tell us the truth. This is reliable. We, we have to be rooted in this. So when those things come, I, I can say, whoa, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ. Be courageous, be strong, do not be afraid. I am with you. I, I'm so dumb, I had to get it tattooed on my arm just to keep it around me. So I'm like, okay, all right, we're good, we're good. I need that. I need the truth because my feelings can fool me just like your feelings can fool you. 
And this brings us back to what's true, what's reliable. This is where we receive faith. You may be like, I, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I have faith. I don't know if I have enough faith. Let me tell you, it's great news. Look at this right here um, from Romans 10. So then faith comes by hearing. We've been talking over the last couple of weeks about whoever has ears, let them hear. Faith comes by hearing, but hearing what? Hearing these positive posts and self-help sound bites? No. Faith comes from a friend saying, it's going to be okay. Faith comes from, you know, someone else that you know saying, you know what, I'm going to fix this. It's going to be all right. No, 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 no. That is not, faith does not come from any of that. Look at this. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And hearing by the word of God. Faith comes from hearing. This has to be in our lives has to be in the lives of the people around us, our, our families. It's reliable. Also, a uh, seed like faith, it takes time. His time. His time. And it, mm, it takes a lot longer. You know, we, we are, we're all about uh, instant gratification. Dopamine is our drug. We love it. What I want, when I want it, how I want it. God's kingdom and his timetable, it tests our patience and our perseverance. Look at this. Do not become sluggish, dull, lazy, lackadaisical, but imitate those who by faith and patience inherit the promises. Faith and patience in the small things. We we see these people who have, like, they have these huge, big breakthroughs, and we're like, oh my gosh, wow. I've seen this over and over again. Here's what I'll tell you. Those people, they've had problems, they've had setbacks, they've had disappointments, but they were patient and they stayed faithful in the small over time. They took care of the seed and nurtured the soil. Patience. Perseverance. I'll tell you, COVID, that was a real thing. I don't know how many of y'all lived through a pandemic before that. Anybody? But it was wild. Like, give yourself some credit. It's like, yeah, whew, man, I lived through a pandemic. I, I know that during that time, there was so much stuff going on, and I took my staff, and we just sat around the table, and I had white sheets of paper sitting there for all of them and a pen, and I said, guess what? Today, whatever your job was, we're starting all over. Here we go. And it was during that time that we were just talking about how we could help each other, and one of my staff members said, what I need you to do is I need you to sit on your front porch And I need you to listen to what God's telling you. That's what we need. And during one of those mornings at home, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was just like this picture. And God's saying, I'm just, I'm sifting. I'm sifting my church. Here's the thing, people then and now will continue to sow into all kinds of things in their life, but not the kingdom of God. We had a lot of downtime to do a whole lot, and people, we found a lot of things to do. And it was during that time that it just came so apparent to me that people had just enough of Jesus to be in the club. Just enough. This whole consumer mentality of like, well, what am I going to get out of this? And what do they have to offer me? And what's in it for me? God's, God's not about gaining an audience or having a following. He's building an army. And for us to understand that 
you know, disciples value disciplines. And, and I, I love here in, in what y'all talk about in these radical minimums and, and just this emphasis on Sabbath. This emphasis on silence and solitude. This emphasis on, on Scripture and, and prayer. Because just enough Jesus isn't going to carry you through the storms of life. It's not. Our, our faith doesn't grow that way. And I, I'm here to tell you all, brace yourselves for November. November. The next, the next 10 to 12 months will expose our true faith, our love for God, and our love for people in ways that we can never imagine. And we'll see it. Faith and patience. The other is our response to believe and act in this. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who, who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith in him, remember, it starts, it starts with him. It starts with him. And we just follow Jesus just one foot in front of the other. The fear starts coming in and we we kind of freeze up but then we take a step of faith we overcome that by taking a step of faith i can't do this i I don't know what to do i can't do this jesus like but i can i i don't know what to do what what if i mess up you will but i won't i i I know you're telling me to do this but i'm not good enough no you're not but i am It's having that faith and responding in faith. We face our fears and we walk in faith. How do we want to grow? How do we grow in faith? We understand that the big, big always starts small. We want to do big things. We want to see big miracles. We want to make a big difference. But it starts small. I wanted to share this with you. Um, my wife, when she was 14, she started volunteering at a camp up in Oklahoma with, with kids that had um, muscular dystrophy. And um, she didn't know what she was doing. She just wanted to help people, this small step. And so um, she went to this camp when she was 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Then we meet, and uh, she's 20 years old, and here we are. She's like, you know what, if he's down with this, then he'll be down with me. And so we go, we go to this camp. We're engaged, and then, then she's thinking about, uh, you know, bridesmaids. And she's like, you know what, like, I don't, I don't really know, like, and then she's like, you know what, my girls in camp are probably not ever going to get to experience a wedding. So guess what? They're all right there, up here on this stage. It was awesome. Just a small step of faith. God, you want me to do this? I'm going to do Fast forward. Fast forward 20 years later, just two weeks ago, we had this awesome event. We've hosted it, uh, and we partnered this year with the Y. Uh, Tim Tebow's Night to Shine is a prom experience for individuals that have intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we, I mean, we had over 220-something honored guests. We had over 370 volunteers, 100-something caregivers. And listen, we party. We had one, one guy last year, he partied so hard on the dance floor, he just threw up all in the confetti. And then he sat out for about five minutes, cooled him off, and he just puked and rallied. He was back up, like, let's go. I sat around with our board a month ago, and I said, you know, I, I just wanted to share with them a little bit, like, this seed of faith 
of taking a step, one step, summer camp. I'm going to go there and I'm going to serve. And then another step and another step over time. Listen, I want to change our whole community because everyone is made in the image of God. Jesus came for all of us. I want people to know that. I, I want these individuals to know that. But it's just a small, small seed of faith. I want to share this with you. Uh, even being here, this is nothing about me. I'm just, it's nothing about me. Please, please don't. Just, I just want you to see and understand the picture of this. Like being, being on staff here 20 years ago, I always, I always had some interns doing student ministry. And uh, one of my interns, um, Jeff Johnson, Hold on, we're going to get there. It's good, though. Jeff Johnson, he's Terry Johnson, one of your elders, his oldest son. Um, he and his wife over in Nairobi, missionaries. I had no idea. Seeds start small. Um, you can show the next one. Sorry, Tyler. Sorry, my bad. Um, this is Cameron Nault. He was one of my interns here. Cameron and his wife, Kimberly, are over in Morocco serving as missionaries. I don't know if you know this, Morocco is 99% Muslim. Cameron, he's texting me all the time. Pray for this guy. Pray for bicycle guy. Pray for hardware guy. Pray for, you know, and I always, I always, I'm, I'm plant, keep planting seeds. Keep watering, Cameron. This, uh, this next one here, yeah, it, it, this next one gets me. I'll just show you this real quick. Go ahead and go to the next one. Y'all know him, Nick Morales. He was in my student ministry here, and he's actually leading worship at One Life this morning. But, you know, he loves students, and he was in my student ministry and I'm telling you this, these small seeds, you're just faithful where you are. You just plant a seed. We had a moment like a, I don't know, this is probably six months ago or whatever. And he's up there leading worship. It's the first song. And little Miles has his guitar. And he starts making his way up the stairs. And I'm on the front row. And I'm like, oh, Lord, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't know. What should I do? Savannah was right there. And then I just had this moment. I'm like, yeah. I'll never forget that. Miles, like, modeling his dad as he's up there leading God's people. Man. I say this because it's just small. These small seeds, this small faith. Big always starts small. It always starts small. Every time we plant a kingdom seed, we have no idea what can happen. There's this redemptive power. The other aspect of this is we expect to get more of what we water. We just, we believe and we know that God's working even when we can't see it. We keep pouring in. We keep, keep watering. This obedience, we act on what we receive. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the forgetting curve. This is super important. I, I kind of geeked out on this. This came up back in the 1850s, this forgetting curve. Here's the thing. When you learn some information, you learn some truth, some knowledge or whatever, you will forget 50% of it in one hour. In 24 hours, you'll forget 70%. By the end of six days, you will forget 90%. We have to act on what we receive. Whatever God's saying, we, we act on it. Delayed obedience is disobedience. This right here, um, James 122, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. So we come back to this. Y'all do this, we do this at One Life all the time, because this is it, man. You talk about discipleship, what is God saying to me? I don't know what God's saying to me. Well, maybe you should slow down. Maybe take the earbuds out. Maybe turn off all the noise. Maybe get alone. It's the scariest place, being alone. It's the best place to hear from God. What's God saying to me, and then what am I going to do about it? 
How will I take a step of faith? How will I act? And then we realize that faith grows in the right environment. That's the last part of this. Um, Nazareth was not the right environment. Who is this? Is this Mary's son? A carpenter? Who gave him the authority? Environment is everything. Jesus knows this and Satan knows this too. And this is why he whispers lies to us like, nobody's listening to you. What you're doing doesn't matter. Nothing is going to change. Because he knows that if that seed gets in the soil, it'll grow and it's contagious because faith is contagious. What's the atmosphere that you're in? Critical people, negative people, people always just finding faults or whatever. We need people around us who are real and not like, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. Oh, yes, God is good. And their life's falling apart. Sick. Ugh. We all have struggles, but we're sharing that together. And we say, you know what? I'm praying for you. I'm encouraging you. Like, you, like God is doing something even when you can't see it. He is working. He is moving. He is acting. Lean into him. Faith, small as a mustard seed. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for, um, thank you for every single person here. And I, I ask that today, um, for for some today, who are followers of you, um, I, I just ask that. that we would, we would slow down enough to say, God, what are you saying? What are you saying to me? Because without faith, it's impossible to please you. So how am I factoring you out of my life and trying to just manage my own life instead of following you on this journey that who knows what will happen, but it, it'll be for your glory. So we, we turn from our own ways and our own disbelief and we say help us help me overcome my unbelief help me to trust you more help me to take a step of faith and for some of you here maybe today just this understanding you cannot do this on your own you can't figure it out on your own you can't save yourself because without jesus god's seed we are separated from the one who made us, the one who loves us the most, the one who knows us. And it's turning from our own understanding, our own thinking, and turning to Jesus and saying, I need you. Take over my life. Save me and put me on this path of of following you for the reason that you put me here. It's faith and faith alone in Jesus Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your life. Thank you for your death. Thank you for your resurrection. And thank you that we have hope in you, that you are coming again. And our eyes are on you. And I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.